the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. All around us right now in the USA and Europe, other continents, South America, North America, Asia, etc., etc., <clears throat> there is uh, chaos and confusion swirling all around us. Now, the chaos and confusion is primarily being distributed via uh, mainstream media. The chaos that is being distributed is not just coming into our minds and hearts accidentally. It's being deliberately engineered, deliberately generated. And you might ask why. Well, that's a good question. Why? Why would anybody want to export chaos, <clears throat> confusion? What would be their motive? Well, in order to understand this, we have to understand an ancient secret. An ancient secret that goes all the way back to ancient Babylon at the time of the Tower of Babel. Now, let's remember, although I've dealt with this and I give you the background <clears throat> and the information on ancient Babylon in my books, like A Prophecy of the Future of America, Volume 1 and 2, Conquering the Matrix, The Babylon Code, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World, and so on. The key, you have to have knowledge. Knowledge is power. You have to have some kind of education, self-education, because you're not going to learn this in the school systems. But this weaponization, and I think that's a good word for for it, chaos by certain high up individuals, and by high up individuals I mean the reality of a secretive elite that truly rules this world from behind the scenes, what is termed a shadow government. That is not, you know, like Twilight Zone time. Uh, that is not like Looney Tune time. That is an accurate assessment of how our planet, planet Earth, works, how it functions, how it really functions, versus the illusions, the fairy tales, the myths that you and I have been taught beginning as little kids being exposed to TV and music and being indoctrinated <clears throat> in the uh, school systems and all the other inputs that we receive as little children. And we're not even aware of all these little inputs that we receive as little children. In fact, I, I would suggest to you that most of us it, it, we just absorb it like a sponge because it's 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 floating all around us from the time we're little kids, uh, you know, in diapers, and as we grow, we're being bombarded with all kinds of information, all kinds of visuals and symbols, and words and vocabulary and expressions and attitudes, and, and behaviors. We're exposed to a whole set and range of behaviors that, that happen all around us, and we can experience these behaviors through, through seeing, through hearing. So, for example, if, if one of our parents, father or mother, model before us on a regular basis, uh, Faces some kind of dysfunctional behavior, okay, like losing their tempers, like an addictive behavior, like like alcoholism or whatever, or any number or or, or, or mindsets. Our parents can actually live out uh, different kinds of mindsets and beliefs in front of us, and as little children, we don't really have a filter. We don't 
question all those inputs. We just we just accept them, and and they lodge in our subconscious minds. And then, after lodging in our subconscious minds, they can become what the Bible calls strongholds. And a stronghold is defined as a satanically energized argument against us. So, for example, let's take the emotion and the spiritual force of fear. Ultimately, uh, fear is more than a psychological emotional response. Ultimately, when you get down to the bottom line, get down to the nitty-gritty, Fear is a spiritual force. So you can't overcome fear. You can't defeat fear. You can't be victorious over fear. If you're merely dealing with fear in uh, just three dimensions or four dimensions, you can't defeat fear if you're just battling against it in three dimensions. And by those dimensions, I mean if you're fighting fear purely on the psychological, emotional battlefield, you may accomplish something, but you're not going to you're not going to remove it from your life. And so, what dimension are you fighting fear in? Most people are fighting fear in the dimension of the physical world or the physical dimension. That's the dimension that we perceive with our senses our visual sight, our ears, uh, what touch and taste, etc. Everything that we experience with our senses can become a kind of virtual reality for us, but it becomes the primary battlefield where all of us are, are taught in one way or another that the way you defeat fear or overcome fear <clears throat> is by fighting it in this physical dimension. And you can make a limited degree of progress by doing that. And I mean, some progress is better than no progress, right? But ultimately, if you really want to be victorious and overcome fear in your life, you have to go to the root of the problem. And that's what I try to teach in my books in a fast-moving way. The books I write, uh, they're in the the, the genre of uh, Bible prophecy. I deal a lot with Bible prophecy. But in my books, in all of them, I interweave powerful truths from the Bible. I interweave powerful truths that can set you free spiritually. Because after all, in Bible prophecy, God's Word teaches us from Genesis to Revelation this fundamental fact that that most people don't know. And that fundamental fact is we are right now, at this second, every one of us, wherever you're listening to me from, whatever nation you happen to be in, anywhere across planet Earth, You are in a battle that is taking place in the physical realm. And if you're fighting, uh, let's say, against fear, which brings a whole host of other challenges with it, you have been taught, for the most part, to fight fear on the physical level, the emotional level, and the psychological level, which can benefit you to a certain percentage. But if you really want to be victorious over fear, you have to go to the core. You have to go to the root. And the core or the root of fear it does not originate in the physical world dimensions. This is such an important truth that I'm sharing with you. Most people don't understand this. The origination point of fear. The devastating power of fear. Fear does not originate in the physical world or the physical dimensions. 
fear is not simply a psychological or uh, neuro uh, psychiatric biochemical series of reactions. Fear originates from a place that is deeper than that, and that place is in another dimension. That's why I talk in all of my books about multi-dimensional spiritual warfare. And God has given you the intelligence and the perception and the ability to understand that easily. It's not hard to understand that. It's really, there are powerful people and groups, the elite, they want you to think They want to hypnotize you into believing that certain truths, certain principles are are just, it takes way too much education and intelligence and thinking so that you can't possibly uh, discover those truths. they, They program you to believe that the discovery of those truths are way, way beyond your reach. And, and you shouldn't try or bother yourself with trying to, to understand them and set yourself free. I expose all of that hidden agenda of this secret elite that does exist and it rules planet Earth. I expose in my book, Conquering the Matrix, their agenda and why they program you and your loved ones and your children and society through media, through words, through pictures, through symbols. They're programming you constantly, every day, into believing all kinds of things, many of which are flat-out lies, because their game plan or agenda is to hypnotize you or program you or brainwash you into being an unquestioning slave and to serve them as unquestioning slaves in their scientific dictatorship, in what they call a scientific dictatorship, or a technocratic elite. So, they don't want the masses, they don't want you, they don't want your children to know these secrets. Because you see, these are the secrets of, of their power. These are the secrets of their wealth. These are the secrets of their ability to uh, control people's minds and hypnotize them and brainwash them. This, this, these are the secrets of how they rule the world secretly. And these secrets are not found. You won't find them in public education or private education or in the media. because They don't want you to know. But for example, in my book, Conquering the Matrix, I expose their secret of mind control. And what I discovered after 40 years of research, and I was having this discussion with my wife, Chris, last night. And uh, when I'm doing a lot of research on a new book like I am now, I have to do this because of what's happening in our nation right now. And the book has to be out fast enough while the doors are still open to get it out. And they need it. They need to know the the truth in it, because that truth will protect them. And uh, God can use those truths to save them and their families. And it would be selfishness on my part not, not to distribute that information. So, I spend endless hours researching, praying, seeking God, crying out to God for wisdom, asking God, literally, I ask God for supernatural understanding and supernatural wisdom. I ask Him for wisdom beyond my own human mind. I ask Him for understanding beyond my own human mind, so that I'm able to research a a wide diversity of of fields and subjects like science and technology and physics and 
sound and uh, healing and genetics and DNA and history and economics and the list goes on and on and on. But you see, the truth that sets you free, the spiritual truth from the Bible that sets you free, the spiritual truth from the Bible that can powerfully transform the lives of millions of people by saving their souls, by bringing them into discipleship with Jesus Christ, and by giving them a biblical worldview. Those things have the power to change the direction of a nation. Those things have the power to save the people of a nation and to save a nation. But let's be honest, you understand this. These are are tough truths for a lot of people. A lot of people don't want to have to stretch and, and think and, and, and cooperate with the Lord in receiving things at a more powerful level. Knowledge is power. So if knowledge is power, and it is, the more knowledge you have of truth, the more power you will have, and more power you will have from God that comes from truth, that power is what changes people's lives, what, what, what saves countless souls, what, what can save a nation, what can save America. Truth light, L-I-T-E, watered down truth, dumbed down truth, has a, a has the ability to minimally impact a nation or an individual. But look, let's be honest. Right now, America is in crisis and chaos. All hell is breaking loose like never before. Our freedoms are in imminent danger. And if if our way of dealing with that on the law-abiding, peaceful, spiritual battlefield, if our response is in, in light of an aggressive, full-on attack by powerful principalities and powers and the dark, unseen forces of, of darkness, which I did keep right the principalities and powers, the fallen angels, the powers of darkness, the, the powers of Lucifer and Satan, they're all torqued up. Chaos is exploding on steroids. Lies. Satanic energies are being unleashed upon this nation and planet Earth in ways we've never seen before. Now that is an accurate perception, and an accurate perception of reality. So as somebody who claims to love the Lord, you and I and other Christians, everyone who claims to love the Lord, in light of the fact that our nation and nations and families and children and and people, Christians and non-Christians, in light of the fact that we are experiencing right now at this moment in history, a full-on invasion by the powers of darkness. I mean, that is what is happening. And if you know history, you know where this is going to go. Because knowledge is power. You know where this is going to go. The full-on invasion is not the beginning and the end of what is going to happen. A full-on invasion is is one in a series of phases designed by Lucifer and the fallen angels to to utterly consume and destroy America, the Bible, Christianity, religious freedom, uh, freedom of speech, freedom of religion to destroy all of those things. Because Satan, or Lucifer, 
knows far better than 99.9% than of all Christians and Christian leaders and churches and ministries. Satan knows far better what God's true destiny is for America in the last days. And Satan knows far better than, than the vast majority of Christians what God's prophetic destiny and call is for America in the last days, what God's prophetic destiny and call is for millions of people in America in the last days. And Satan knows far better than uh, Christians in other nations. Satan knows the prophetic call and destiny of people and nations all over the world. And many of you are listening to me right now from these nations where God has a special prophetic destiny for your nation. And you could be listening to me in a European nation or an Asian nation or in the Americas or Iceland or anywhere. And God just doesn't have a prophetic destiny for America. God has a prophetic destiny for every nation. It may be different, but he has a destiny for every nation <clears throat> and a destiny for every person and a destiny for every Christian. But the way Satan and the fallen angels and those that serve him can win the spiritual war in the invisible realm is Satan weaponizes deception, spiritual deception, uh, lies. Satan is the father of lies. Satan knows how to teach and implement uh, occult sorcery, which is really the same thing as scientific mind control, brainwashing, uh, uh, hypnotizing, spiritual deception propaganda. Satan knows how to weaponize and energize those things, both in, in the external world that we live in and in all of our internal worlds of our personal emotions, memories, ideas, beliefs, fears, etc. So, so the battle takes place in multiple dimensions. In the physical realm, with the senses, uh, in nations, in cultures, in societies, in people, but but the raging spiritual battle also takes place internally in the hearts and souls of men and women of mankind everywhere, and this battle is is raging at this moment. And, and the only question every true Bible-believing Christian <clears throat> should be asking themselves is this, Lord, what am I to do in light of the fact that we're in this last day's battle? What would you have me do, Lord? And we ask it uh, together as, as Christians, as the body of Christ, as members of a church, as, as uh, uh, people who are citizens of a particular nation, we, we must ask the question, if we're true Christians, if we're not too Christian, if we're not true Christians, then we can play hide-and-seek and all kinds of other games with the Lord. Adam and Eve played hide-and-seek with the Lord. It's a kid's game. How did Adam and Eve play hide-and-seek with the Lord? Well, they disobeyed God's word. They listened to Lucifer speaking through a uh, serpent. And they ate of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, which activated the law of sin and death. They began to die, and Satan became the temporary god or ruler of this world. So how did Adam and Eve play hide-and-seek with God? So in response to their disobedience in rejecting God's word, Adam and Eve attempted to hide from God what they really did. So Adam and Eve 
played hide and seek with God. They regularly met with God and walked with God, and um, they were doing so this day. <coughs> and uh, God wanted to know where Adam and Eve were because Adam and Eve were hiding. They were playing hide and seek because they didn't want God to know that they had sinned. Adam and Eve attempted to hide their nakedness before God, of which they were ashamed. So they covered their their private parts with fig leaves, attempting to hide from God the fact that they were naked. And they were ashamed. They were ashamed because they were naked. And then fear came upon them. And they had never experienced fear before. But the fear that came upon them was more than psychological fear. It was spiritual fear. So what Adam and Eve tried to do to hide or cover their sin from God is they played hide and seek. They tried to hide from God, forgetting that God is all-knowing and can see anywhere. Nothing is hidden from God. So that's what we try to do here in America and other nations. We're trying to play hide-and-seek with God rather than asking ourselves this question. Francis Schaeffer asked, Dr. Francis Schaeffer asked this question with the title of his book, and, and I don't, I'm not sure this is an exact quote, but pretty close to it. Dr. Francis Schaeffer's book was called How Should We Then Live? It was written about 35 years ago. And in that classic book, Dr. Francis Schaeffer raised before the body of Christ in America and around the world, he asked the important question, how should we, as people who call themselves true biblical Christians, how should we then live in, in light of the fact that we're, we live in a post-Christian culture where, where our society is moving faster and faster away from Jesus, from biblical principles, and a biblical worldview? In light of all those dark and negative things, Dr. Francis Schaeffer asked the question, how should we then live? <clears throat> that question needs to be asked again. In light of what's happening in America and around the world, with chaos and crisis, etc., how should we then live? How do we live? What do we do? You see, this is imperative. What we're asking for is the guidance of God in, in a time of crisis and chaos. And God has promised us in his word that he will never leave us or forsake us and that he will lead us and guide us and give us wisdom and protect us in any situation. The prerequisite, of course, is that we are obedient to God, we're humble enough before God, that we will actually submit ourselves to God and actually ask God for his wisdom. And then, <clears throat> in obedience to God, we, we do what he tells us to do, which is to cry out to him for wisdom, to seek for wisdom and guidance and direction um, as one would, would search for uh, precious jewels and gold and silver, that we are to aggressively seek the wisdom and the guidance of God so that we will know specifically how we should live and operate and act and think and deal with all the things that we are now facing. <clears throat> this is critical. And there are so few, there are so microscopically few ministries, few authors, few speakers, few churches, there are so few uh, that actually will equip God's people with specific answers and directions and wisdom and guidance in the exact time that we're in. You can search far and wide. There, there's a very tiny percentage that will teach that, that are communicating that. But if you attempt to search far and wide on the Internet, on radio, on TV, in every form of communication from Christian ministries and leaders, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is not meant to be a put-down. It's meant to be an accurate assessment. 
there is only a very tiny percentage of Christians, Christian ministries, that are communicating to God's people how should we then live in specific terms. Now, that's what Dr. Francis Schaeffer wrote about. In fact, when he wrote his book, he was among the few, the tiny percentage of Christian leaders and ministers and pastors and authors. Dr. Francis Schaeffer was among that tiny percentage, maybe 1%, who, who was yielding to the Lord and who wanted to, through his books and speaking and teaching, he knew he had a burden from God to equip God's people to know how should we then live in, in light of the fact that we're in anti-Christian culture. That was 35, 40 years ago. <clears throat> now, I'm dealing with the same question. and. What's in my heart is a deep burden from God, a deep burden from the Holy Spirit that never leaves me. I have a burden from the Holy Spirit that never leaves me, day or night. It weighs upon me 24-7. I carry it with me wherever I go. And among the other things that I cry out to God for, is I cry out to God in, in ways like this, whether my head's on the pillow or I'm doing chores or I'm doing dishes. Yes, my wife and I share responsibilities. So that means Paul McGuire is just like any other guy out there who has his honey-do list, which includes taking out the garbage and many other things. And those are actually doing those things. I get a lot of prayer done while I'm doing the things. And I'm crying out to God and I'm asking God, God, give me supernatural wisdom and understanding so that I can so that I can minister to your people, Lord, so I can equip your people, so that I can give your people the knowledge and wisdom and practical knowledge they need to not only survive and overcome but so that they can fulfill their God-given destiny. Lord, give me supernatural wisdom and knowledge that I can communicate to God's people so that we can turn the tide of the spiritual battle in, 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 time of, in a time when so many people and so many uh, Christians are in a temporary state emotionally. They're demoralized. They're depressed. They're, they're filled with anxiety. They're, they're remorseful. They're, they're dealing with oppression, spiritual oppression. And the reason they're dealing with all of those things, and all of us have to deal with those things or fight the temptation to deal with those things, is because uh, in America especially, there, there has been a series of current events that have dealt a, a emotional, spiritual death blow, if you will, to millions and millions and millions of people. And this has happened in other nations also. And yet, I, as a Bible teacher, as an evangelist, as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, somebody who deals with Bible prophecy and has prophetic gifting, there are times when the Lord puts a burden on me from the Spirit, His Holy Spirit. And the reason the Lord puts the burden on from His Holy Spirit is that's the Lord's way of, of motivating me and mobilizing me to come to Him and cry out to Him for wisdom and guidance so that I might share it with and teach His people so that destruction may be averted. And so I've devoted a lifetime of studying the Bible, but I've also spent a lifetime walking in a close, personal relationship with Jesus Christ, where I've 
talk to him and he's talked to me, not, not in an out loud voice and still small voice. I've walked with the Lord, not because I'm better than anybody else, not because I'm so holy and pure, not because I deserve it. Because of grace, unmerited favor, I walk with the Lord. And so I see what's going on. And uh, the Lord put this burden on. He's put many burdens on. And when the Lord puts a burden on you, it really is a joy. It's a burden, but it's a joyous burden because you know the burden is coming from God. It's an assignment from God, and therefore joy and anointing springs up. It's a hard thing to to explain. But I see... I see the remorse and the despondency and the defeat in the eyes of God's people. And that's where, and you know what I'm talking about, that's where the rubber meets the road. You see, that's where you and I and every Christian is faced with with this choice. And we're all faced with this choice right now. We're faced with the choice of just going along and pretending in in a fantasy hide-and-seek game that you know, we can apply <clears throat> the same spiritual truths, business as usual. We just keep repeating what we used to do before, and you know, maybe everything will work out. But that's not how God works. God expects us to seek his face in every moment of life, and God expects us Above all things, in time of crisis and intense spiritual warfare, God expects us to seek his face and cry out to him by by studying his word, by intense prayer, etc. And so, as a Bible teacher, I can draw on all the truths that I've studied and learned God's word, all the promises from God's word. You know, God delivered Noah and his family from the flood. God delivered <clears throat> Lot and his family from when God judged Sodom and Gomorrah. God uh, delivered Adam and Eve when they sinned through his grace by providing a covering to them for their nakedness, and that covering was what the Bible calls a type or shadow of the blood of Jesus Christ, which cleanses us or covers us from all sin. So when God uh, told Adam and Eve, who were naked and ashamed and afraid before them, before him, God gathered the, the skins of animals to clothe Adam and Eve of their nakedness. So you can picture what happened. Some animals had to be killed or slaughtered, which re- which resulted in the spilling of blood. And then the fur of those animals were used to cover Adam and Eve. Well, that was just not an accidental assignment God implemented. That was God's way of revealing a type of teaching Adam and Eve about the coming of a future Messiah, the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. And so in the Old Testament, the Jews and the priests would sacrifice sacrificial lambs, spill their blood to take away the sins of the priests and the people. The Bible says that without the spilling, uh, without the uh, shedding of blood, there's no uh, cleansing for sin. It's the blood that takes away sins. So, So in clothing the nakedness of Adam and Eve, with the skin of an animal, God was like illustrating the future coming of Jesus Christ, the sacrificial Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. And so when he was crucified on a cross, his blood was spilt. And when we put our faith in in the blood of Jesus, our sins are forgiven. So what Adam and Eve had to do in terms of receiving animal skins was like a living illustration of the sacrifice of uh, 
a lamb or the sacrifice of an animal and the need to, to, to shed blood to cleanse away sins, and which also resulted in the covering of their nakedness. So when I say to you, the Lord reveals truths to me, it's not because I'm so holy or perfect or better or super spiritual or whatever. All the ministry gifts and callings of God are based upon grace or unmerited favor. And how do we have unmerited favor with God, unearned favor with God? We have unearned favor with God when we exercise our faith in the fact that Jesus took away our sins <clears throat> by, by dying on the cross for us. We didn't earn righteousness with God. Righteousness was given to us as a free gift in Christ. We just put our faith in it. So you draw upon that as a Bible teacher, and you review in your mind the stories, not the stories, the historical events that happen in the Bible, like David slaying Goliath, the giant, like Elisha and Elisha and the chariots of fire that came down to deliver, the splitting of the Red Sea, which delivered the children of Israel from the Pharaoh who represented Satan and all his chariots, and they were pursuing the children of Israel as the Red Sea split apart. And as soon as the children of Israel crossed, the Red Sea came in upon itself and drowned, and drowned the Pharaoh and the chariots, etc. So you see, and then Joshua and Caleb, by faith, going into the promised land in Canaan and, and slaying all the giants, which were Nephilim. And then they possessed, they took over the land of Canaan based on their faith and offering up to the Lord a good report where they said, we are well able to take the land. So all of that is nice to read and nice to study and nice to teach children and nice to know. All of that is nice to hear uh, in a pew or a chair at a church or a Bible study. All of that is nice to hear when somebody's ministering to you or whatever. But all of those miraculous historical accounts that we read about in the Bible can never become 100% real in your life. You will never know the amazing, awesome reality and truthfulness of what happened to all these historical accounts of God's miraculous de deliverance for his people. None of that will come real to you. None of it will really hit home. You will never receive a revelation from God on how to totally understand and own those truths until, until you come to the place in your life or somebody close to you comes to the place in their life where literally the chaos, the crisis, the attacks, the evil coming against you or a loved one or a the nation you're in or a community you live in, that the, the, the evil attacks against you, the crisis and the chaos against you, the spiritual war or other kinds of warfare against you is so destructive, so deadly, so intense, that literally the question arises, will I live through this or will I perish, will my loved ones perish, will my nation perish? And all of a sudden, uh, as if somebody dumped a, a bucket of ice water on your head, and, and the, the chill and shock from the freezing cold, it startles you awake. And it's only when you have to, because of the physical cir circumstances and the physical desperation of the hour, it's only when you have to, when there's no other way. See, see, for the children of Israel, they, God brought them to the place where there was no other way for them to escape from Pharaoh and the chariots. 
They were brought right up against the Red Sea, and they thought they were going to perish horribly. And they were angry at God, and they were angry at Moses, because Moses, this great deliverer, didn't seem to deliver them. He brought them right up to the Red Sea, which meant that, you know, in a very short period of time, the, 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 the Pharaoh and his chariots were going to come down upon Israel and slaughter the men and the women and the children and just massacre them in bloody warfare. Because there was nowhere for them to run and hide. They were boxed in. The only way they could go was to go into the ocean, excuse me, into the into the Red Sea. And and they would have drowned. So Moses held up his staff in under the anointing and supernatural authority of God and commanded the Red Sea to part. And miraculously, because these things don't happen in a natural dimension, miraculously the Red Sea split apart, the children of Israel made it way, they made, made their way through the Red Sea uh, on dry ground, and then after they had crossed over the Red Sea, the Red Sea collapsed back in upon itself, drowning and killing Pharaoh, all of his armies and all of his chariots were drowned in the water. And there have been archaeologists who have explored that geographic area of the Red Sea, and they have claimed to uh, find archaeological relics of the chariot wheels, of the chariots, the swords, the armors, and other artifacts that prove the existence of the pharaoh, the pharaoh's armies, the pharaoh's, pharaoh's chariots, and they prove that at one time the Red Sea came in upon and drowned the, the massive Egyptian army along with the pharaoh. But you don't know. You're not able to access by faith. You're not able to really own and use these truths until God allows you to be in a place where there's no way out, no escape, except total trust and faith in God. That's what happened to Joshua and Caleb. That's why they were able to take the land. So here we are in America, and we are experiencing uh, a level of spiritual and other forms, a level of spiritual and psychological warfare and economic warfare. We're experiencing attacks adversity on a level we have never known before. And this th same thing is happening in other nations around the world. And I've devoted my life to communicating to people, to communicating to God's people, prophetic truths and truth uh, that will help people, save people, equip people in times of crisis and chaos and just in life in and of itself by winning souls for Jesus Christ. That's my assignment. And so I know by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit working inside me, I know that the truths and the promises of God that he has given you and me and every Christian wherever you are around the world, that God wants to bring alive all of those truths and promises in the Bible so that you know it's not just a bunch of religious gobbledygook, so that you know that these promises are awesome and backed up by the supernatural God, and that God can perform miracles in the past, and God can perform miracles in your life today. And just because there's a, a, a lot of bozos out there flippantly and, and through manipulation uh, uh, overusing the word miracle and stuff like that so they can make money. I'm not saying all of them, but they're, but they're out there. Just because there's a lot of people who are con men and use the word miracles does not mean that there are still not authentic miracles from the living God, Jesus Christ. So that's what God has called me to teach and preach and do supernaturally by his power. 
That's why he, he has placed the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon my life. And he's poured out the anointing of the Holy Spirit on your life, and many of the people you know, and some of the Christian leaders and pastors that you know. God has poured out his Holy Spirit. And God pours out his Holy Spirit in our lives for a multitude of reasons. One is, it's the only living the Christian life is impossible. Important to know that. It is impossible to live the Christian life. You can only live the Christian life through the, pa- the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit and putting your faith in it. So, the first thing is, in order to live the Christian life, in order to do any kind of ministry, in order to bear the fruit of the Spirit or the gifts of the Spirit, in order to be a true Christian, every Christian must be born again, have their sins forgiven by the blood of Jesus, and every true Christian who wants to be used by God must be clothed with power from on high which is talked about in Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2. That being filled and anointed with the Holy Spirit is mandatory and essential. Otherwise, we cannot be victorious. And so, what God is trying to teach every one of us is he, all of you, and me, together, and everyone listening, wherever you are on planet Earth, every one of you, who are born again, or who are thinking about becoming born again. You know, the door's wide open. God loves you. He'll accept you just like he is, just like you are. And he loves you. There should be nothing stopping you from coming, just calling out his name, Jesus, just saying to Jesus, Jesus, forgive me of my sins with your blood. Jesus, I'm sorry I'm a sinner. And Jesus, I ask you to make born again. That's a prayer. God will answer it. And and nothing should hold you back from praying that prayer because God isn't looking down upon you. God loves you. God is actually waiting for you right now at this second. Some of you listening somewhere on planet Earth or in the U.S. God is, think about this. There are a certain number of you right now and you know who you are because it's like the Lord is tapping on your heart with his finger. And you can sense that the Lord is kind of tapping on you right now. And the Lord is communicating to you right now, tapping upon you right now. He's telling you that what you just heard, God was referring, God was speaking about you by name. God was referring to you by name. And God wants you, and he's using your name. He wants you to either return to him or come to him and ask to be born again. And, and, and God is not mad or angry at you. God is, is he's actually waiting for you. God loves you so much that he's actually waiting for you right now to come to him and ask for forgiveness, ask to be cleansed with the blood of Jesus, ask to be born again. Has to be forgiven, and has to be uh, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And God loves you so much that He had me put the brakes on certain things that I was going to say <clears throat> and, and give you this free offer of salvation in Christ because the Lord told me to do that. And the reason the Lord told me to do that is because. He's, he loves you. He knows who you are right now. And he's actually waiting for you right now, wherever you are. God is actually waiting for you. So I'm just going to give a brief pause because what I'm going to ask you to do on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ is simply pray a prayer out loud. I just told you how to pray it. Just say, get down to the nitty gritty. First of all, just come to him or sitting in your chair, in your car, wherever you are, or silently if you have to, and say, Jesus, I want you to, I ask you to forgive me of my sins by, by your blood. Say it. Then say, Jesus, I ask 
I, I thank you for cleansing me of all of my sins by your blood. Say that. Then say this. Jesus, I invite you and ask you to come into my life right now and make me born again. Just say that out loud or silently. Prayer to the Lord. Finally, you ask the Lord, Lord, I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can live a victorious Christian life. Say that and mean it. Thank him for doing all of that. Now that's why I pause. That's why the Lord paused. And if the Lord tapped you, if you felt the Lord was tapping on you, and if you felt or sensed that, that God was speaking to you personally, tapping on you personally, then you should have already said those prayers, silently or out loud, or you should have already gotten up from your chair and gotten down on your knees, or don't get in an accident while in your car, while doing dishes, while while having your earbuds on and jogging. You could have done it jogging with your earbuds on, and nobody would know. They would think you were singing along to a song. So you've already done that, and God has saved you, and he's pouring out his Holy Spirit upon you right now. And there's a huge number of us all over America, all over the world, who are tuned in together right now to the Paul McGuire Report. And we're praying for you, and we're rejoicing with you right now that you're born again. We want you to know that we love you in Christ, and we welcome you into the body of Christ. So, a fair number of you just did that. Welcome into the family of God. And then, <clears throat> if there happens to be <clears throat> anybody hesitating, that hesitation is a sin. Keep hesitating. You have no guarantee that you'll be alive tomorrow morning. I'm not trying to manipulate you. Is reality. None of us know when it's our last day or hour. <clears throat> so, my my intent in saying what I said was not to emotionally manipulate you. I'm, I'm saying it and am saying it out of love and genuine uh, concern for you that the Lord has put in my heart and the hearts of people praying for you right now. People who listen to the Paul McGuire report. All the people who have uh, pledged to be intercessory prayer warriors, every single one of them are, are praying for you right now. So that, that's a huge number of people, of people actually praying for you. So I'm going to ask you to obey God right now. And you know God's speaking to you. You know God's calling you. And so I'm going to ask you right now, as a minister called by God, through the supernatural power of Jesus Christ, I am asking you to go into prayer silently or out loud, stand up or sit down or whatever, whatever physically works for you, out loud or silent, preferably out loud. But but if you can't, then God will honor prayer that's silent. But I'm asking you right now, at this second, to throw your disobedience to the ground, throw your pride to the ground, And obey God, because God is commanding you to come forward. He's giving you a choice. He's giving you a choice, but he is commanding you. He's giving you the power to rebel against him and and disobey him. But because the Lord Jesus Christ loves you so much, he's commanding you to come to him in prayer out of your free will. Ask to be cleansed of all of your sins through the blood of Jesus. Invite Jesus into your life. Be born again. And ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So, those of you that were in hesitation, you're no longer in hesitation. Because you were given an opportunity by God. You knew it was from God. And right now, I sense in my spirit that there's a significant number of you, perhaps all of you, that you are right now praying those prayers that I told you for forgiveness of sins, cleansing of the blood, being born again and filled with the Holy Spirit. So God wants you to know, seize your obedience, 
He sees the fact that you're praying and asking him for all of these things. And right now, as you're praying, God is miraculously cleansing you of your sins. He's uh, forgiving you of your sins. He's delivering you from all kinds of bondages. He's come into your life and made you born again. And he's filled you with the Holy Spirit. That's happening to you right now, miraculously. And what is going along with with it experientially is, this may be a quiet prayer in which you're not feeling any intense emotion. So, so the reality and truthfulness is not based on your emotional response. You may be feeling no emotion, like I felt no emotion when I first prayed. <clears throat> or, second, you began to say the words, Lord Jesus, cleanse me with your blood, forgive me, or whatever. Your, you, you began, your eyes began to tear up as the Spirit of God is touching you. Body began to tremble from the, the deep emotions that are being aroused as Jesus is ministering to you. And then a huge wave of relief as oppression and darkness is being lifted off of you, and you know that you're born again. <clears throat> and for some of you, you feel and experience Jesus inside you, you feel and experience the Holy Spirit. You feel and experience your your deliverance, and you're crying, and you're filled with joy, and you're filled with excitement, and you're filled with this sense of wonder and delight over being supernaturally set free, and knowing that the devil has been bound from your life. And for some of you, being touched by the literal power of God is so miraculous and you and the thing about it is you know that you know that you know that you know <clears throat> that's what what's happening is not psychological it's the fact that the power of the living god has touched you and he said free your body is shaking shuddering in some cases and you're weeping and crying in some cases in some cases you're sobbing as you're being delivered as you're being released from that which has bound you and in many other cases, there's this, I know that I know that I know that Jesus Christ is God and I'm born again, and I know that I know that I know that if I was to die tonight, I would automatically go to heaven because of my faith in Christ. I know that I know that I know that I'm truly born. Now, I didn't expect this to happen. I didn't plan for this to happen. But right here on the Paul McGuire Report, When God moves, when the Spirit of God moves through His Word or His Holy Spirit, when God gives me a burden or speaks to me or gives me a command, the rule of the Paul McGuire Report, Paul McGuire Ministries, and all our outreaches in media and church, one of the number one rules is, is that when God starts to move or God wants to say something, that I get out of the way in obedience, and allow God to do whatever he wants to do, I get out of the way, which I just did. I I got rid of my own topic, and I simply went with what God told me to do. And that rule is, is why this radio program, this podcast program, the Paul McGuire Report, why we continually bring in souls in a soul harvest. People are continually saved. Backsliders continually come to Christ because of obeying that rule. And then we have our video programs like the Prophetic Emergency Alert, all the programs on the Roku channel, all my messages, sometimes three to four hours long, from Paradise Mountain Church, recorded professionally live at our meetings. You can watch on the Roku channel, get to that to paulmcguire.us. So what I'm trying to share is that right now in the middle of this program, God ministered right now in the middle of this program with your help and your partnership, we brought in a soul harvest. Many souls were saved. 
Many people were won to Christ in the last 15 minutes. Many people were born again. Many people who were backsliders repented of their backsliding and returned to Christ. Many people had the seed of the word of God planted in them. And the Lord will bring it into fruition, perhaps in the future, at at his time. So what I'm trying to tell you is in the context of this uh, uh, radio program, the Paul McGuire Report, just flowing in the context of this program, we brought in part of the last day's soul harvest. Souls were saved. We evangelized the lost. We, We brought backsliders back to the Lord. We preached and taught a biblical worldview. And so real, genuine, authentic New Testament ministry occurred. We obeyed, and you obeyed with us in partnership. Jesus Christ's great commission, which is to go into all the world and preach the gospel, we just did it, uh, to make disciples of all nations, teach them a biblical worldview, we we do that. Occupy the land until I come. We've been teaching you and do that spiritually through prayer. <clears throat> and uh, bring in the last day's soul harvest. Where the fields are white with harvest. We've been, we've been obeying God. So when you're looking for a ministry to partner with both spiritually and with your donations, contributions, and prayers, you want to look for a ministry which not just lip service, but really prioritizes the command of Jesus to win souls to Christ and to fulfill the Great Commission. And you want to partner with a ministry that that makes that their highest priority, along with teaching the Word of God and Bible prophecy. So I want to thank all of you who partnered with me right now Souls came to Christ all over the world. You'd be surprised. The emails, the, the messages I get, the letters I get, the hand, wonderful handwritten notes from people to take the time to give me a testimony, share with me uh, about what this program has done in their lives or somebody else's life. <clears throat> all, so right now, all around the world, we came together as partners under uh, the umbrella of Paul McGuire Ministries or Paradise Mountain Church. We came together under that umbrella. Many of you pray regularly for me, the program, etc. Many of you spread the messages far and wide so we don't get censored, and that brought in many new people in our audience so that they could be exposed to to God's Word. And then finally, many of you, I'm thankful for, regularly contribute financially to this ministry with your donations and financial contributions. So all of you who are partnering with us in those ways, I want to be emphatic about this. You share in the rewards that Jesus Christ promised to all of his people who would commit to be faithful uh, uh, winners of souls, who would commit to making disciples of all nations, uh, uh, bringing in the last day's soul harvest, uh, making disciples of all nations, and communicating a biblical worldview. I didn't do it alone. I could not have done it alone. I was able to do it because of your partnership and your prayers, and your help. Because of that, the the truthful word is, I didn't do it. We did it together. We did it together. Okay? And I thank you for that. We did it together. And so, only we'll, we'll only know in heaven, but this was just one casting of the net, and the fish... Our, 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 the net is bursting with fish, which represents souls being saved. And you, you share in the reward. And don't slough that off. You share in that word, reward. God promises that when you and I and all believers stand at the judgment seat of Christ, which is not the same thing as the great white throne of judgment, 
The judgment seat of Christ is for believers who were saved, were guaranteed entrance into heaven. But before we pass into heaven, God evaluates our lives, and then God rewards us for everything we did for him out of a pure heart, and God burns up as wood, hay, and stubble everything we did for ego, pride, self, etc. And that, that place is called the judgment seat of Christ where God actually gives out rewards for faithful soul soul winners. You get the soul winner's crown. There's more than one. It's like an Olympic reward, like getting a gold medal. You uh, are rewarded for everything you did and everything you sacrificed and everything you gave and everything you prayed out of a pure heart for Jesus Christ. You're rewarded with many rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. So I want you to not just say, oh, that's, that happened. In this moment of time, souls were saved all over the world. And we all rejoice and thank God. And every single one of you uh, who chose to participate in that in any way, you share in what's called the soul winner's crown. You will see in your life what God means when he says, he or she who wins souls is wise. And you will get the reward that God gives all of his people who, who choose to, to win souls for Jesus Christ. So I want to thank all of you right now. And I want to say this. No souls would be saved without your partnership. No truth would be communicated without your partnership. I thank God for you. When you dedicate your money, your talent, and your time to God, then you have entered into partnership with God, and God will supernaturally bless you. And God will supernaturally bless you because God trusts you to be faithful to do all the things that he's commanded you to do. God bless you. This is Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. (laughs) 